My name is Juliet Kayyem. So in some ways, this panel might be going back to our roots in a, in a way, sort of about traditional uh, physical security given the changing threat environment that we're all encountering. Um, and in many ways, it's a, despite the fact it might be traditional, it is a very, very difficult issue because when you think about sports security or complex security, what you're really thinking about is disrupting in some ways or trying to minimize the disruption uh, against the reason why people are going to these events, right? People don't go to the Olympics. They do not go to the Boston Marathon. They do not go to the New York Marathon to think about security. In fact, they want it to be easy to get there, to see, to cheer, to do whatever, and then leave. Uh, and so that's a challenge for these three gentlemen who have been, or has been a challenge, who have been in this field uh, for some time, thinking about how do you balance flow with the primary duty of safety and security, which is to protect the fans, the participants, the athletes themselves. So immediately to my left is Ed Davis, uh, who is, of course, the former police commissioner of my city, the city of Boston. And many of you recognize him and his work during the Boston Marathon bombings. He is now has his own security consulting firm, Davis LLC. Then in the middle uh, for our international feel is Boon Wee, who for 12 years was the chief of police for Singapore, uh, the police commissioner. Uh, and as importantly for our discussion was the uh, previous president of Interpol. Uh, and then uh, a busy man up until this morning, uh, John O'Connell is the deputy chief of the citywide counterterrorism unit for the NYPD, uh, dealing with, of course, the New York Marathon security. And then he reminded me President Obama was in town last night. <laughs> uh, so thank you for being here. We hope you oh, get a nap you. after this. Uh, John, let me actually start with you. Um, uh, because the New York Mar City Marathon just ended. Uh, and it's in some ways very familiar because you have it every year, you know what date it is, no surprises. So um, what? how has your thinking about security changed both post 9-11 with new threats, but also after the Boston Marathon? And how do you make that work and still have a, a good, fun, open, accessible marathon? Yeah, we, we understand we, the event has to be a fan friendly event or else the, the enemy has won. We, 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 if we put out a footprint that offends the runners or the participants, it's, uh, it's not good for anyone. So uh, we always built in a physical security to the marathon at the start and the finish. Uh, we use sand trucks, you know, military style delta barriers. We, put, we bring them out quite a bit so they're not really visible. But that's a V-bid protection, vehicle borne explosive protection. But you know, after Boston, we started looking at things a lot differently. And, uh, you know, the uh, low-tech tactics, the firearm, the small explosive device becomes uh, a, probably a heavier threat right now. So we have to adapt to it. We do numerous deployments. You know, uh, we start uh, weeks out on end. We look out and see if anybody's doing operational surveillance on us. We put out hostile surveillance teams. Uh, recently with the New York Roadrunners, within the past, right after the Boston incident, we started screening the runners. Uh, if anybody tries to get in by the lottery of the marathon and tries to get in to get a device and they're all uh, walking through, uh, magnetometers and handheld magnetometers. Uh, screening 50,000 people is quite a task, and uh, the roadrunners have helped us with it, with it and it's uh, working out very well. Uh, we always have overflow plans in case the, uh, the, the flow rate on the magnetometers isn't there. We build in an extra 100 officers with hand wands, but we successfully screened uh, 50,000 people. Along with that, the physical security, uh, the canine uh, component, uh, we have a lot of rad nuke detection and uh, basic uh, explosive trace detection all over the city. And I'm just asking to give people a sense of numbers. How many runners and how many spectators over the course of how many hours? Just how fast it builds uh, up. The, the runners themselves is over 50,000. Uh, then you have the family reunion area where everybody goes to greet the runner after the race by Central Park. Then you have grandstands in Central Park. Then you also have spectators along the whole 26 miles of the route through regular neighborhoods. So we, we're tasked, it's a big task to, to uh, cover the whole route. but. Uh, fortunately enough, New York City, we have uh, almost 35,000 police officers, yeah. so uh, we get the job done. So, Ed, you were the police chief of a uh, city that also hosts an annual uh, marathon. You know the date, you're training, you're practicing for it for years, I mean, for months before, um, and then uh, 2013 happened. So, looking back on it now, uh, sort of, you know, tell us sort of what went well that day, uh, but looking back several years later, what do you wish had been in place or that you're advising people still holding marathons that they really need to think about? 
Right. Well, you know, prevention is really our first job, and we failed at that in Boston. Um, but in kind of a, an odd way, um, the preparation that we did uh, for that event assured me that we had done everything that we could do. We had a, we had a plan that was 60 or 70 pages long. Uh, it listed all of our resources that were available to us, all of our partners. Um, it, in large part, set the stage so that the medical response could uh, happen very quickly and effectively. In 22 minutes, we had cleared the field, and Rich Serino was here, who's a former EMS director in Boston, uh, your colleague in FEMA. But Rich uh, played an enormously important role in preparing the city for that event and was actually there at the finish line when the bombs went off. Um, 42 people left that, um, left that course in critical condition. Um, more than two dozen amputations, and no one lost their life uh, that was moved out of, out of there. Uh, the, the three people who died died at the scene immediately uh, when the incident happened. So uh, that's a testament to the preparation and to the planning that was done. Uh, tragically, they got by us. Uh, they were on the course for uh, 12 minutes. Uh, they walked on, uh, on Gloucester Street. Uh, we had we had run dogs down uh, earlier in the day, and then just before the elite runners had uh, had finished, worked very closely with Tom Grill. Tom is here, the BAA head. Uh, he runs the Boston Marathon, both runs it and runs it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Tom is a, a legend in Boston, uh, but we worked very very closely with him, and uh, and so all of this preparation that we did, uh, I remember standing there at the Forum Restaurant and looking at the bodies of Lindsay Liu and. Martin Richard, he's eight years old. Lindsay was in her early 20s. She's a graduate student, young boy, literally killed at the scene of this great family event, and thinking, how are we going to get over this? And it was the fact that we had that plan in place, and I knew that we had done everything humanly possible to stop this that, that gave me the ability to move forward and, and do the investigations. If this, I just want to finish by saying one thing. People think about security as if it gets dropped by helicopter into an event and it's a very you know paramilitary style thing and the police just come in and do what they do and they leave nothing could be further from the truth this is a very people oriented process and it can't work unless the boston police are working very closely with ems but more importantly closely with the baa and and negotiating what works and what doesn't work doing things that make this a family oriented event but it's the human side of this thing that I'd like to concentrate on. And the fact that whether you're dealing with the BAA and the marathon or the Occupy uh, events or all the sports uh, victories that, that we've managed with millions of people at them, it's a, it's, a, it's a people process that requires a real human element. So let me, can I just ask you the last part of my question though, looking back mm -hmm. with the benefit of advising for the future of marathons is there anything that you would say gosh i wish that that might have been slightly different or if we we could have done it differently or we learned this from what happened yeah. you're like a reporter ted kennedy told me that i should always just say what i want to say yeah. the question. <laughs> we've known but, each other too I, long exactly you go. Um, really yet i know the yeah, answer too that's right. just <laughs> yes, you, do. Yeah. Um, you know quite frankly um better communication among uh, some of the, the law enforcement entities that are out there. There's, there's a you know, wide range of people who are working on this problem, and I, and I think that some of the, um, the after-action reports sort of point to uh, the, the necessity of, of better and more open communication. Um, clearly, uh, there, there were uh, you know, things that were happening in the community where these, where these bombings were planned um, and we would meet with um, we would meet with communities across the city, thinking that we had very good relationships with the Muslim community, for instance. And we do, but it's always the same people that come to the meetings. And expanding that group beyond the the, the usual people that come in became a real critical component of our response afterwards. So those are two areas that I that I could really point to. We could have done better at. Uh, so Boone, you. You know, in New York and Boston, uh, I don't want to say they're not small, but they're cohesive units of mm -hmm. police departments, right? And they've known each other a long time. You've been in the force 20 plus years. You had been in the force, same. Uh, when you get to the international arena, it just becomes that much more complicated. 
Uh, and while Boston and even more so New York cater to international audiences, they are predominantly New York or Boston. And so how do you manage different countries, their security apparatuses, uh, and different cultures and norms from everything from what they're willing to protect to uh, uh, issues of privacy and, and, uh, and civil liberties. Yes, yes, as you uh, correctly pointed out, when an event becomes international, then a lot of complicated layers come in. Um, for one, you get foreign dignitaries coming, yeah. and so you've got to deal with all the various uh, security measures you got foreign fans uh, who may not understand the culture of your country. They may not have a good experience necessarily with the authorities in their own country, so they are very distrustful. You got language problems. Uh, they are not familiar with the place, so you know escape plans, contingency plans may not sink into their heads. Um, you also have uh, problems of uh, screening these people when they come in uh, yeah. at your immigration checkpoints. But of course, on the positive side, uh, and here I want to make a plug for Interpol. Uh, mm. Interpol has uh, quite a good capability in helping countries uh, who host such functions. They'll deploy teams that will help uh, you screen their, against their databases. Um, and then for people who may want to assume the identity of uh, some genuine person, uh, there's a whole database of stolen and lost travel documents. I think at the last count, it was over 50 million. But these can be done very efficiently, the, the screening. Um, of course, uh, you've also got to think about the um, broadcast, the international broadcast of such uh, events, which, are, as we heard earlier in the morning, um, billion dollar contracts. Yeah. So uh, I was posed this question once, you know, when we first hosted the uh, F1 in Singapore in 2008, uh, when I was the Commissioner of Police, and the Cabinet asked me, you know, uh, under what circumstances are you going to stop the hmm. race? Yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, it, 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 because one has never been stopped before. Yeah. So then you go through your head and say, wow, what happens if there's a credible bomb threat? You know, do you actually stop the race and evacuate? We did. Yeah, yeah. so, so uh, it, it's a real uh, problematic issue here. No, it is. I mean, you touch on the most important thing or one of you know, the unspoken in security. We like to believe that mm. protecting people is the most important thing, but it costs money. Mm. And uh, what you're describing is that pressure to have the event because lots of people are making yeah. lots of money, including our sponsors, uh, versus a, a potential threat. And so, you know, why is it on state and local and country or international agencies to pay for safety and security? And should we be thinking about this differently in terms of cost? Because someone's making a lot of money off this thing, and it isn't the New York Police Department. <laughs> John smiles. But I'll, you know, Boone, do you? Well, Obviously, uh, in, in all these uh, international events, uh, you've got the international organization that's organizing it. Yeah. But you also have a local, uh, a local sponsor or a local organizer, right? Yeah. So the deal is made between the two. And whether that local organizer or sponsor is a government or some other agency, uh, the deal's been made. And hopefully, the, all the security costs have been calculated uh, for the F1, we disrupted a lot of people because, you know, it's right in the middle of the city. Uh, shops have to be closed, uh, uh, barriers put up a month before. And, and so there are costs involved. But obviously, the government has decided that having an F1 is worth it in terms of the tourist receipts, in terms of the publicity for Singapore. And so all these costs have been put in. Mm -hmm. And the security costs, of course, uh, they assume that we can deliver. But then when things get more complicated, then you say, oh, I need this and this. I mean, you mentioned about drones. Yeah, so uh, how do you stop uh, drones? So you have to now have a low-level low radar detection system. You've got to have a means of spotting who, who is actually flying that drone. Yeah, these are all new things which have come up and which were probably not uh, taken care of in the original contract, which was signed maybe six, seven years ago. I'm, okay. Just, I work for a mayor that um, was very fond of saying Boston is an international city, 
and therefore we have a responsibility to handle the security for these events. But he was also very active in Washington, so whenever uh, there was a big event that cost us millions of dollars in security, more often than not, FEMA or, or, or Homeland Security or somebody get, and Rich was uh, one of the people that got tapped on this, uh, we, we had a really good record of, of re recouping our losses from the federal government. <laughs> <laughs> our senator was Ted Kennedy at the time, right. so that always so, helps too. Right, yeah. uh, but it, it is true that as the burden changes, or security is so intense now, the way we think about it, that the price tag is not as often mm -hmm. off by, as you saw in the London Olympics, a billion dollars, right? Which is not insignificant change. Uh, so Ed, in terms of some of the threats that happen, because anything could happen at one of these events, uh, what always does seem to happen is a concern after, after there's been a boom or an attack uh, with uh, crowd safety and crowd control, the, the masses just freaking out or trying to get in to see their favorite team. What, what's out there in terms of our knowledge about how crowds work? and uh, are we training to what's out there? Mm. Well, we've learned lessons in Boston that um, year after year, um, we, we pick up a little bit more on how the crowds were moving and where they were going and how best to, to shunt them off into areas where they won't hurt themselves. And uh, that led us to, uh, to doing more and more preparation work as we step into every event. So uh, I know New York uh, does the same thing. We were just talking about it in the, in the green room, but um, so we look at the venues, uh, we look at the history of the crowds, we look at where trouble happened in the past, and then we set up bicycle racks and deploy um, uh, public auto platoons to, to, to deal with um, the problems as they've manifested themselves and to make sure they don't happen again. And that, that has led us to a very intricate process of using bicycle racks to keep cr one crowd separated from another. Uh, the kids run out of the campus at Northeastern and Emerson, uh, but we keep them separate from the, the other campuses uh, up the street and, and only allow a few thousand people to gather instead of 80 or 90,000 people to gather in Kenmore Square, which is what happened when we first started to look at these things. So you, you pick this stuff up as you go along, but it really is a problem-solving process. And if you train your offices in problem-solving using the SARA model to identify where these things can can be problematic. One, one thing that we found was by shutting the windows and, and putting drapes down at the liquor establishments in the area of Fenway Park, crowds that used to gather outside, you know, they were on the street, they couldn't get in the bars, but they would gather outside and look through the window to watch <laughs> the, the end of the game. And we had unbelievable fights occurring there. Um, so what we did was we had them shutter the windows, make sure that they, you couldn't see the game from outside, and it, it solved the problem. It, little things like that work. Yeah, yeah. I can. I, I, sorry. No, no. Please. Yeah, I mean, in New York, we have the same problem. Is you know, New Year's Eve every year, there's large crowds. You know, as he mentioned, the bike rack and the barrier systems. You got to build out an outer layer because when you fill up, in this, and you're shutting down the, the inner perimeter, you have to have an outer perimeter with a barrier control system. You know, the Joint Operations Center is open, they're monitoring it, they're getting feedback from the outer units, and you gotta shut down the event, and you can't shut it down right at the event. You gotta go out to the side streets, a couple avenues out, and start filtering it out and shutting it down. Yeah, I just wanted to add that, um, of course, modern technology helps. Uh, Singapore is a pretty digitalized uh, uh, country and city. So we have uh, digital maps of most of the major buildings and the roads and the infrastructure. So we can run simulations and, and that helps a lot. So, so we can actually tell, okay, the crowd builds up and then where will they go? And so you, you, you plan your security around that. But as Ed and uh, John have said, uh, nothing like walking the ground also to find yeah. out some of the things which right. all these things will not reveal. And so it's a mixture of uh, planning using digital tools and then also walking the ground. And I must say that uh, the first three years when I was commissioner of police, when the F1 was, I did a lot of miles walking around yeah. <laughs> and I didn't enjoy the race at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, when, when we get to this issue of sort of crowd control and how to control the crowd, we sometimes know who's going to be there because of ticketed event and then the distinction with the unticketed event. So marathons tend to be unticketed. Maybe there's VIP areas. Super Bowl is ticketed. Uh, 
And then there's this other factor, which is the parades after, which no one would ever think of being a big deal, but sometimes they're eight or nine times bigger. Uh, how do you keep the apparatus in place, right, between the ticket event and everything going on outside? And how does intelligence work when there's 100,000 people who you don't even know who they are because they've just showed up, mm. as compared to ticketed people? Right. Well, I, I mean, you, first of all, there has to be a clear delineation between the ticketed event and the and the outside event, and there really has to be, as John said, these these rings of uh, of security around around the uh, the event, um, so that y you know who's where, and and you also know that there's a group of people that have been that have not been vetted. You know, I mean, they've come in on the outside. They they haven't gone through wands. They haven't gone through detectors. <laughs> They're a more dangerous, potentially dangerous group than the group that is is closer. Uh, but those concentric circles of security are common, whether you're talking about force protection in the military or a presidential visit or, or an event like this. They, we use the same uh, the same strategies and and, and ideas, and um, we have undercover teams that are working the most uh, dangerous areas that are looking for people that don't fit with what's happening. And, and I'll tell you. When I first saw the film of the bombers walking uh, down Boylston Street uh, in front of the Forum restaurant, uh, I was able to notice both of these guys, as, as the, the, uh, the FBI analysts and, and the other analysts in Boston had already identified uh, the, the younger brother because he put the bomb down right there. But these two guys, if you look at the video, they are walking purposefully down the street without distraction. They're not looking at the runners. They're not looking at the restaurants. They're, they're on a mission. It, they look like cops, mm. actually. Mm. If there was a cop walking down that street on a, on a call, he would have the exact same gait and the exact same appearance because he or she is doing something. They're not part of the crowd. They're not there for entertainment. And so those undercover cops that we have on the crowd are trained to look for people like that. Tragically, these two guys got by us, but, uh, but that, those are the kind of things you have to look for. The, the unusual, the, the thing that doesn't fit in the environment. Yeah. So here again, you can use technology, of course. I mean, all these people have to go to the venue or the vicinity mm -hmm. through some means of transportation, right? So you can monitor the uh, subway crowds, how many people have gone out at what station. Uh, well, you can have your drone up there. To, to, with cameras to, to look at these places and analyze unusual behavior. But as Ed has emphasized, nothing but works but the, the cop on the ground. And maybe you can even train volunteers, the marshals and all that, to look for unusual behavior. New York City is the same thing. When you have a non-ticket event, you don't know. The one thing you do know is that most likely they're coming from the transit system. So we have to put out hostile surveillance, plain closed teams far out, like Ed said. And they got to be trained enough to recognize the indicators. And if you put out a bag screening operation where you're going into the subway system, you want to have a team within sight that can say, hey, that guy reacted. He didn't want to go through the screening process. He saw what he thinks is an explosive trained dog. He turned around and left. And that's important. Like when you look at the video, you get a chill in your spine. You, maybe somebody would yeah. pick up on the guys, you know. And it's uh, people throw off indicators when they see the police, uh, a checkpoint. Uh, if they're going up to the marathon and they see hand wands and magnetometers, they're going to react different than the average person that's going there to run the race. All three of you have talked about these concentric circle, circles and successful security sort of pushes uh, the security out so that not everything is focused on the event itself. Uh, so uh, one way uh, that we can get better with safety and security is also through design before you even have the event, the baseball stadium, the football stadium, uh, the, the LA Olympics or, you know, uh, or future Olympics in LA potentially. Uh, how has design changed in light of uh, the threats that we now face today? And, and Boone, sort of internationally, what are you hearing about, yeah. well, let's make the stadiums better? Yeah. I think a lot of lessons have been learned, huh? and I think ICSS has collected quite a bit okay. of information on how a uh, stadium should be designed for security as well as safety. But uh, I want to add that uh, there are certain things that you have to do also in that sense that uh, you've got to make sure that the communication system within the stadium is, 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 is fit for purpose. And in Singapore, our national stadium, we have a dedicated encrypted uh, hmm. uh, system for the police and, and, and uh, uh, emergency response people. 
Uh, also, we digitalize the whole thing so we know if gas is introduced, where these things will travel, and you know, we put all the <laughs> sensors all over the place. So you can actually design something um, to, to keep your risks down. Yeah. New York City, we uh, three new stadiums in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. You know, City Field, Yankee Stadium, Barclays Center. Uh, the counterterrorism division was invited in and made recommendations uh, in the design phase of all the buildings. You know, it was fortunate and. Uh, the designers, they went for you know what we had proposed. You know. So they were receptive to whatever security changes? Yes, they, we were invited in, we made our recommendations, and the, uh, the changes were accepted. So uh, all of you describe how technology and, and, uh, and your teams work together, but now I'm going to ask a hypothetical. Uh, is there some device in this world of sports security, uh, there's a lot of people in the private sector, in the corporate world, is, that you wish you had, right, that would help you in this difficult balance between being welcomed, welcoming and protecting people, right? That would, uh, and just sort of curious, you know the market out there, you know what's out there, and sort of curious your thoughts on that. Well, I, I know enough um, to, to tell you that there is no magic wand that you can wave over a group of people and pick out uh, the attacker, whether it be a, uh, you know, the, the attacks that we're most concerned about are low cost, high impact. And uh, someone has a rifle in a backpack, someone has a, uh, uh, you know, a, a handgun uh, with uh, uh, a large capacity magazine, um, or, or they use uh, pressure cooker bombs that are fairly simple to put together and, and very, you know, very deadly. Uh, those are the kind of things you're looking for. And right now, uh, there are very sophisticated electronic systems that work at airports that can detect um, explosives. Um, they don't work in a crowd. They don't work at a distance. I know there's some development going on, um, we we're just talking outside with, with a one company that is, that is working on this, um, you know, that use video or other, other detectives um, to try to pick up the signature of explosives uh, for suicide vests. Uh, but none of that stuff is fully baked at this point in time. And so someday we'll have it. Uh, the video systems that we're seeing now can, you know, can, can, can read your uh, iris at a distance and the, the retina stuff. It, it, this, the video is becoming extremely sophisticated. Someday we'll be able to do that. But right now, mm -hmm. it's, it's very much a human process. Yeah, I agree. I mean, the, uh, right now we're relying on canines, which have advanced tremendously. Mm -hmm. uh, they're very effective. But the a machine that detects, uh, you know, explosives, you know, and uh, as you have a queuing line or a, a, an entrance would be a, a ph phenomenal device. You know? that, oh, go ahead, Ben. Yeah. Oh, so I'll turn the question slightly uh, mm -hmm. around and, and say that, well, the technology is all out there, but not really tested. And we need to actually have better means of having pilots and public-private cooperation to try out things. And that's how you learn, right? You fail quick and then you learn quickly also. Um, and also the need to have a whole of government approach to such things because uh, sometimes you learn from the fire people, the ambulance people, mm -hmm. the military, and if you get your act together, then uh, your plan is so much better. For people in the audience who come from sporting organizations who are essentially focused on the, you know, sort of the team and the win for the nation and making sure that the teams are supported, uh, how, what is the best way they can work with local uh, police officials, local safety and security officials to optimize uh, the entire experience for everyone? Are there some sporting federations that need a little lesson or, and there's others that are doing it well? But if you could provide some advice. John, maybe I'll start with you because you were talking about the New York yeah, Roadrunners. We, you know, we did the Super Bowl with the New Jersey State Police and the host committee. Uh, the one very important thing is let us into your command center and we'll have you in our command center, right? It opens the lines of communications, you're sharing the cameras, you have somebody right in their control room in the stadium, which did happen for the, at MetLife, you know. Yeah. That's, uh, you know, a very important part of it, you know. Uh, other than that, just, the, you know, the cooperation, the pre-planning, uh, exercising together, tabletop exercises, stuff like that to get everybody on the same page. There's uh, so many threats out there, and we're going to talk about, in particular, in the next session, drones and, and potentially other threats. 
and devices that can help with security, but in the end, something's going to happen, right? I mean, this is the reality we live in. You just can't find two random brothers who just decide one day we're not going to go after the July 4th, we're going to go after the marathon. And uh, while mistakes may have been made, no amount of surveillance is going to stop all bad things from happening. So I want to uh, focus on what we in this space should be communicating better to people who attend these events uh, and preparing them for the unlikely, though very, though possible, uh, you know, likelihood that that uh, something bad will happen. Uh, and how do we educate the crowd? I guess you were talking about none of this stuff works in crowds. How do we educate the crowd then? You know, that's a that's a huge issue that I think Homeland Security is more or less responsible for. Um, but it's also the responsibility of local and state agencies to get that word out. The truth of the matter is cell phones don't work when there's an emergency. They just don't. They, these, I've, you know, they didn't work for us when, when the marathon happened. The cell phone systems went down. Some people said the police shut them down. That did not happen. What happened was, and I, I've, since, I've done a lot of research on it since then, these systems operate at 90 to 95 percent capacity and when there's a surge in, in use, uh, they fail. And so if you know that, then understanding that you no longer have an ability to pick up a cell phone and call a loved one, you need to have other means of coordinating where to meet. And you know, the military calls it a rally point, but there should be a place where you've all decided that if something bad happens and you get separated, we're gonna go here and don't leave that particular location uh, unless unless uh, you find someone um, and you know secondary locations because you never know if the first place is going to be a problem texting seem to work uh, the texting systems are a very effective way to keep in touch with people and so are um, social media so we use social media dr effectively after the marathon to uh, reduce the chaos tell people where to go uh, ask them, you know, what was happening. It was it, social media is a dialogue. It's not a, <laughs> it's not a, it's not a posting poster board for for a police department. But if you have a social media program and you've used it, uh, it can be very effective. You can't turn it on the day of an incident and expect it to work. It's if you haven't developed a relationship with your social media people and also with your community before the crisis. You can't develop that relationship after the crisis happens. I think that's the biggest lesson that we learned. Billy, do you want to add anything to that? No, that's second everything yeah. that yeah. Uh, he said. I agree with everything he said. I mean, yeah. the, New, the New York Road Runners for the marathon had everybody's email. You know, they were yeah. twittering out messages. If anything happened, they had a system in place. It was exercised at the tabletop we had in the police headquarters, and they showed that we could get the message out, or they could get the message out if something happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very important. Yeah. So we've talked about every audience except for the one that we're going to be celebrating tonight, which is the athletes themselves. Is uh, uh, Monica Sellis being one of the more famous examples of a uh, of a athlete who was very open and exposed and therefore and suffered because of it? Uh, Boone, I want to start with you. Is uh, there are lots of athletes that come to these events and how do how can we ensure their safety and security uh, or should we just decide that we're going to leave it to private they should just bring their own well if they're celebrities then it's a different thing right they, right. they will bring their own that's yeah. true but if they're part of a big contingent then uh, you would have made arrangements for them right yeah. i mean for the olympics you have the olympic village and they've got very uh, strict rules uh, singapore held the first youth olympics and so they had kids, uh, well, you call them kids, right? Because they're supposed to be under a certain age. But they had their own chaperones, their parents, uh, and, and, and that was quite well, well taken care of. And I think the main thing was that we wanted them to enjoy the event and also uh, learn about the Olympic spirit. Yeah? So security wasn't that tight, but uh, we gave them enough and a lot of leeway to do certain things. 30,000 runners, for, I mean, how do you even think about protecting the runners? Uh, or is it just impossible? No, I mean, you, you got the start and the finish, which are attractive targets by themselves. But we're a large department. We have to, you know, we, we put out resources along the whole route. And, you know, you have to have a concentration. We did it at the medical stations, you know, where crowds gather. 
uh, entertainment zones. That's, you know, musical entertainment zones. We put some assets there. And then we have roving assets, too, that, uh, you know, they show up unannounced. You know, they're random. Uh, it keeps the bad guy on his toes. We show up with heavy weapons teams at a random location along the route. It sends a message that, you know, you don't know where we are. We pop up out of the subway with heavy weapons teams. We just, it's 26 miles. You still got to cover it. Uh, it may be random and, uh, you know, you may have your, your post may be spread out, but you still got to pay attention to it. And we, we swept the whole route with canines and uh, we recheck it hourly and stuff like that. You got to, you got to hit the whole route, you know. I guess the most attra attractive target would be the start of the finish, but obviously if you get steered away from there and you're on a mission, you're going to find a piece of the route that you're going to try to make an attack on. So you can't ignore it. Yeah. So my last question is just uh, generally about management. Uh, you all are dealing in a complex management space of which security is just a piece of it. There's just so, if you think about a city hosting an Olympics or hosting FIFA or something, it is just different pieces. How do you assert the equities of safety and security? I know they're obvious to you, but where there's hundreds of other different equities that seem equally important. And maybe after the Boston Marathon it's easy, but how can, how can we learn from uh, past mistakes to ensure that safety and security is brought to the table at the beginning? Well, that's, that's a huge problem. Uh, and, you know, the seven marathons that I managed um, were, were, did not have that crisis uh, around them. So, um, you know, we didn't have the benefit of, uh, of what is happening now as far as in that argument. So, uh, believe me, the most important thing that you can do as somebody in my position is to first manage up and to make sure that the mayor of the city um, is on board with you as far as what the threat is and what needs to happen. And so once you have that strong relationship with your mayor, and I was very lucky to have that, um, then when you, when you negotiate with the different agencies that are involved, uh, it's not just the police coming to the table, it's the whole leadership of the city or state or whatever it might be. Um, and there are certain things that are non-negotiable. I mean, you know, I talked about human systems and about how you really, have to, you really have to negotiate the issues, but there are certain things that have to happen. And, and once, you, once you establish those minimum requirements, you know, and you can go back and forth uh, if somebody's got a better idea, so you should be open to conversation. But you should also say, no, in this particular case, you're not going to do X, Y, and Z. That can't happen in the city of Boston. And, and if, you, if you have a very good relationship with the political structure, you can make that happen. What about in the international space? We have so many competing demands, and security can be sort of a let those guys deal with it. Yeah. Yeah, I think, well, let me talk about my Singapore experience first, because I was commissioner of police from 97 to 2010. And I must tell you that before, the 9-11 incident, tragedy, uh, things were quite different. But after that, everyone took us very seriously. <laughs> but of course, um, you have to be professional, you have to show that you have no self-interest in, in how you get things done. And that internationally, I understand, is not uh, a given because some, unfortunately, some police forces are, are not professional. They may have corrupt people in there who take advantage of such things. So that, that's, that's an issue. Mm -hmm. yeah. Final words, John, did you want to? Yeah, just uh, you know, on something like that, we, we always start with the uh, event organizer, you know, a, about a year out for a major event. They go to City Hall, the special events people, and uh, you have the traffic management, the crowd security, and then we always throw a counterterrorism overlay in there. So we put an exec in from the counterterrorism bureau right into the initial planning phase. And like Ed said, there's certain things that we're going to demand that we do, you know. We understand it's got to be fan friendly, you know, the presence, and there's ways to do to police the event without, uh, you know, having everybody fearful of what's going on. So uh, the important thing is the Super Bowl, we stepped in probably a pr over a year and a half before the Super Bowl Boulevard. Uh, you know, the U.S. Open, we start a year out. Same thing with the, uh, you know, all the, all the visits, the papal visit, et cetera. So everything starts about a year out, and we start right out with the counterterrorism overlayment. You know, all right, this is your crowd control plan. Here's our plan. And, you know, there's a back and forth with the organizers. and. Uh, in New York, we have a good relationship with everybody. Okay, we are going to, uh, I think, lead to a break or someone's going to announce something. But so before we do that, I want to thank uh, Ed, John, and Boone for doing what they do and uh, ensuring our safety and security while we still get to have fun, which is the most important thing. So thank you.